Hey guys, I'm here with Danny, my coach. Hey guys. We're just gonna run through some introductions first and foremost, so I'll let Danny introduce herself. So I'm Danny. I coach Millie, as you're probably aware, because you just introduced me as that. <laughs> I have been coaching now since 2015, and I started as a one one-to-one personal trainer, um, worked on the gym floor for about four years, and then transitioned online. And I now coach both competitors and non-competitors such as Millie, yeah. um, and I love doing so. Yeah, I honestly, so I'll kind of talk into a little bit of detail as to how I started with Danny, why I started with Danny. So it was last year around May or June time, I think that I decided I wanted to compete and I spent a lot of time doing my research for bodybuilding coaches to try and find someone that was a right fit for me. Um, and I did a few consult calls um, and I did one with Danny and she sat through me interrogating her for an hour over Zoom <laughs> um, because I had loads of questions that I wanted to ask. Um, but one thing that I thought would be useful for us to cover is what to look for in a coach in general or maybe like in a, in a bodybuilding coach because um, it's a question that I get asked quite often and I know how I went about looking for my coach and Danny's had loads of coaches herself so she also coaches loads of clients so it's going to be useful for you guys to have that perspective. For me in particular, I'm someone who likes to learn a lot and Danny's content was like really, really informative. So you've got the Female Fitness Podcast on, on your Instagram, you've got YouTube, like you're on different social media platforms that allowed me to get to know you a bit more as like what you like as a person, what your just experience and knowledge is. And then also obviously clients because you, you need to kind of have the results there. Yeah. So I think after all of that and then sitting down with you and finding out how you worked and the fact that you had a, a lot of time for me before we'd even started working together, it just made me think that we were really the right fit. Um, because I feel like I learned from you not only just like, oh Millie, you need to go and do this, but it's educating me yeah. and helping like me gather my knowledge, which then helps me as a coach. So that's why. I decided to work with Danny um, and I think yeah it'd be good to hear your perspective on what you think is good for when people are just you know looking for a coach yeah. whether that's in general or for prep. I think when you're looking for a coach like a basic qualification of some kind is a, is a good thing it's a good sign if someone has zero qualifications it's probably a little bit of a red flag so that's not to say that they have to have a degree in nutrition or whatever but at least some kind of basic qualification such as PT, if you're wanting a prep coach, potentially some nutrition qualification. So I've got my uh, performance nutrition diploma, which I really enjoy doing. And I think as a coach, if you are a coach or if you're looking for a coach, look for someone who's always wanting to further their knowledge and isn't complacent and doesn't think that they know everything because you never know everything. No. Um, and it's really important that you can trust your coach. So pick someone that you know you're going to be able to put 100% trust in. If you are constantly doubting your coach's decisions throughout the process, it's going to cause so much stress and Millie will probably sort of yeah, like agree on, with that. I, there's not been one time I've ever second guessed or thought anything that you yeah. said, like ever. Because and through a prep, like everyone, there's always gonna be someone giving their opinion on what you're doing. In the gym, people, even general population people who don't compete, don't have much of a concept of bodybuilding, they might say, oh, you're looking very small, you're looking very, you know, you're looking a little bit ill maybe, because that's just how bodybuilding is when you're pushing to the extremes. Yeah. So you need to be able to put your trust in your coach so that you don't get stressed out by those opinions that are thrown your way. Um, so trust is really, really important. And I think if you're looking for a competition prep coach, it does help if they have stepped on stage themselves because then they can empathize and relate to what you're going through. And yeah. I think that's invaluable, really. That's one thing which I totally forgot to mention is that Danny's competed like she's got loads of experience with competing um she for me in particular i knew of bodybuilding i knew that i kind of wanted to look to compete and see what i could firstly do with an improvement season but when it came to like federations categories classes all of those details i didn't have a clue i didn't know anything about the tan the sparkles the bikini and also i'll be honest for me and my first coach going into my first competitive season, it's why I kind of went for you as a bikini athlete because um, 
I don't know how well I would have been able to at first with perhaps, I don't know, like a male coach, like, excuse me, what um, what cut of thong do I need to wear? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, or, or can they point you in the right direction? Do they have the right network and the contacts? And you've got to think about that um, because I didn't know any of that at first as well. And I just felt like because of Danny's personal experience that she would already have all of those answers for me, which you have. So yeah. it's made it smooth sailing. Like all the questions, which to me were quite big and profound to you, they're just like, oh, I know what you need to do, off you go. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's really helped. And I think way. going back to your point on education as well, like not everybody wants to be educated as a client and that's absolutely okay. If you're one of those people, you might decide to go with a coach who maybe their check-ins are a little bit less in depth and that might be okay for you, say if they're just like, I don't know, drop 20 grams of oats or whatever. <laughs> but if you are the type of person who wants to be educated and supported, make sure that you're going with a coach who provides that, who gives a little bit more of an in-depth service, maybe more in-depth check-ins via voice note or maybe you're able to contact them on a messaging app of some kind. Um, because some coaches do just give quick fire responses that's absolutely okay but if you want more than that make sure you're going with a coach who provides more than that yeah another thing that is important to note is I've had coaches before where like email was the primary form of communication and to me that is not it wasn't personal enough particularly for how much I was paying. Um, I think that's also, you know, you've got to consider your price point and the value that you're getting and the time that you're getting for that. Um, and like Danny and I don't just like message 24 seven, like, hey, how are you doing today? But I know that if she, if I ever need anything, she's there on the yeah. other side of WhatsApp. So, so I know that I can expect our same day response in terms of whatever might be an issue rather than like sitting and waiting on a formal email. I just feel like we need to move away from that a little bit if you're looking for a coach who's really, really invested and caring into your journey. Um, but that's just my perspective. The same as my perspective with wanting to be educated and wanting to know why I'm doing certain things to my body. I would urge anyone to want to know why <laughs> they are being told to do something, but you know, that's down to the individual. So um, I think, I think that's pretty much all of my thoughts on, on what to look for in a coach. Yeah, I think the other thing would just be make sure that your coach's values are in line with your values. And if, for example, you want to minimize the negative effects to your health during a prep, make sure you're going with a coach who, who cares about that and isn't just doing what they're doing to produce a transformation or um, get a medal and make sure that they're actually gonna take care throughout the process, basically. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we, um, well, I put a question box um, on Instagram and Danny shared it to get some questions for us um, in terms of just like coach client relationship or just my prep in general, which I'm going to go through. So the first question that we've got is to Danny, what is it like coaching a coach? And you have quite a few PTs and coaches who you do coach on, yes. on the team, so you're quite familiar with this. I quite enjoy coaching coaches because I know that they're going to want to further their knowledge and I like to coach that kind of client who I can actually, you know, use the more advanced knowledge that I've gained with them and help educate them throughout the process. I like that coach-client relationship. I know that some people might not like that so much. They might not to like to be asked as many questions and things like that, but I enjoy the fact that they want to learn and I enjoy sharing my knowledge with them. So. It's, it's great from that perspective for me. I think it could be challenging if the coach themselves was overthinking things and they've got to be able to sort of switch off a little bit and just get their head down and execute. So that's really important and that's, that could be a challenge if they were the type of person to be like, Oh, I hope like, I'm not the type of person. Maybe I should like do that. this, maybe I should do that, like questioning things all the time. So, you know, they've got to be able to put their trust in you, going back to what we said earlier. But I really enjoy coaching coaches and I think it's it's really rewarding in a lot of ways. Yeah. And it means that I know those people are willing to further their education, they're willing to become better versions of themselves and like I had a, a client who was a coach the other day actually, she said to me, 
oh, I feel like I should be doing everything perfect, like in terms of her execution when it comes to training. And I feel kind of like wrong when you're giving me feedback. And I'm like, no, that's a good thing that you're willing to learn. Yeah. And there's always room for improvement. Even like Olympic athletes, for example, they still audit their training and improve their performance in so many ways. So it doesn't mean you're bad at what you do. It just means that it's good you're willing to learn. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also, I think all everything that Danny's ever kind of suggested or we've spoken about, it's a it's a partnership with a mutual goal. Like if Danny says something, most of the time we're just like, yeah, because I do agree with it and I was speaking to someone with like lots more knowledge and experience. But if I ever have a question about it, I just ask, okay, how come? And then that's that's it. And yeah. you just get on with it. Um, whereas if you're constantly, you know, questioning and second guessing your coach and you don't actually trust them then you might have to, you know, have a little bit of a further think about what's going on there. But I never ever feel that way. So I think the way I think we have a really good dynamic in terms of just how we yeah. how open we are, which is really good. I agree. And like as a coach as well, I'm always open to what clients have to say. And like Millie said, it's not it's not a dictatorship. It's a collaboration and it works both ways and like I'll always take on board her feedback because she's the one who's living in her body 24 yeah. seven. <laughs> so she's gonna maybe notice some things that I might not see. For example, if her digestion is slightly off, I'm not gonna know that unless she communicates that with me. So it's really important that the communication goes both ways. What is What are some of the disadvantages of being a busy coach? Okay, so from my perspective, I think it's you actually explained a lot of this in a podcast that you did I think it was this week but you yeah. want to produce the the best quality of your work and when you're a coach you know you are always a coach you don't clock off um, from being a coach you can try and get your downtime and you need to but sometimes um, whether that's your personal life, life circumstances stress um, just being busy with prep things like that you, I need to make sure that I am setting myself like in the best environment and time and when i'm feeling best within myself to produce the best quality of work for my clients um and so i was speaking to um matt about this earlier actually i said how i had a backlog one morning i woke up of so many messages i had so much to do in the day and i was on the stairmaster i was like i'm not going to reply now because like that's not going to be the best quality of service for my clients and I have to sometimes remove myself from my work in order to be able to come back to it when I am feeling my best but when you are really caring and attentive you don't necessarily want to leave things so I think that's probably for me is removing myself and making sure that I'm just being careful to be the best that I can be for my clients yeah I completely agree with that and it's like I would, I spoke about this actually on the podcast that I did this week, what Millie just mentioned, like I would wake up in the morning and be so anxious because I knew that I would wake up to so many messages and I would literally force myself out of bed and get straight onto my laptop without even getting ready properly, like no joke, I look like an absolute hobbit <laughs> and I just wasn't preparing myself properly for the day and I would go into work in a really rushed state and it wouldn't again produce my best quality work. So I had to just give myself a bit of a reality check and be like, what are you doing? You know, that's, that's not productive. Give yourself some time in the morning, go on a walk, prepare yourself properly for the day and then get into work when you're in a less, at least a less stressed state. And that's gonna produce so much better quality work. And um, yeah, it's just so important to, to be mindful and set your boundaries but it's really difficult to do that and that's probably one of the most difficult things about being a coach like I I really struggle sometimes to put my work phone down and I struggle to know that there's a message that I haven't replied to and I'm, I'm still reminding myself that it that's okay and you can't be working 24 7 because you will reach the point of burnout and then you won't be able to produce any work whatsoever so yeah you've got to just be be respectful of your own time and the fact that you do need to have somewhat of a life in some way other than your work yeah. and your work is not your whole entire life. It's a huge part of my life, don't get me wrong. And like, I work a lot, but it's important for it not to be your sole entire life because what, what if your business, I don't know, went down the ship for some reason, have you got anything left after that? Yeah. <laughs> 
cutie and Bill. I've got nothing left meme. I've got nothing left. I've got nothing left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I can't help myself. What do you think makes a bad client? Someone, again, who doubts their coach's decisions. So you've got to be able to put your trust in your coach. If you can't, then don't have them as a coach. And you should feel like you should ask questions if you don't feel like that, don't have them as a coach. I think what, I wouldn't say anyone is a bad client because it's the coach's responsibility to learn how to coach them to the best of their ability given their circumstances. And if there's someone who struggles, the coach should be able to help them with their struggles. So it's not that anyone's ever a bad client, but you have to be willing to check in on time. You have to be consistent with that. You have to be willing to follow what your coach has set you to do because if, for example, your coach had set you a certain set of macros and expenditure, you didn't follow those targets and then you checked in with your coach and said, oh, can we change the targets because I'm not making progress? That's not necessary because it's the adherence that needs to change. You need to improve your adherence. It's not the actual targets themselves that need to change. So you need to be willing to be adherent so that your coach can monitor your response and make any necessary changes and you have to be willing to put the work in if you want to see results ultimately yeah yeah i agree with that the other thing that i think sometimes clients might think that they're bad clients or they might be embarrassed if they've kind of like lied to their coach previously or they might not be being entirely truthful um i don't necessarily think that makes a bad client but what i think is that you are only shooting yourself in the foot if you're not being yeah. entirely honest so it is really, really important that your coach knows everything because they are literally just there to help you. Like that is all they want to do. A good coach will never tell you off for doing something. They're not a teacher. They're not gonna have a go at you. Um, they are literally just there to help you. And also just to emphasize, not trying to like outsmart your coach because your coach has set you certain things to do for a reason. Now, if perhaps that doesn't agree with what you think or you think differently, then ask and talk about it, but trying to think that you know better, why have you invested in that coach anyway? And do you not trust their knowledge? Is a question that you might have to ask yourself. So I think those are things to be really like importantly considered from a client's perspective. Yeah, and just try and respect the boundaries that your coach has put in place because like we were saying earlier, like we work really hard as coaches. We really care about our clients. Like if you're one of our clients, we care about you a lot, probably a bit too much. And we really appreciate it. I really appreciate it when people respect my boundaries that I put up, for example, don't expect to reply at like 10 p.m. at night or something like that because um, just like you guys want to switch off from work sometimes, sometimes we have to do that as well. Yeah, and that's, I won't lie, that's one thing I found with prep I've, I've really needed to do is just to have like two hours away from my phone before I go to bed because I'm finding it hard to sleep anyway. So if I'm sleeping and I'm seeing like loads of messages which I can you know remove my phone and I will kind of turn my notifications off but likewise it's important to consider that your coach is not going to reply to you then you know don't double triple message because they are probably winding down for bed so it's those kind of important things that um, are it's just you know courteous I think um, is a good yeah. way to put it how is it that competitors are able to grow so much muscle whilst in a calorie deficit usually people won't gain muscle in the deficit i mean you might gain some in some circumstances and it's more likely if you're using performance enhancing drugs but most people won't gain muscle in a deficit they might look like they do because they lose body fat and therefore you can see the muscle tissue that they're carrying i look more muscular when i'm lean because you can see all of the definition and then obviously when you carve up for a show and you saturate muscle glycogen you look even fuller and you have that like pop to your physique as well as being shredded so yeah, it's usually just that the muscle tissue is almost revealed as opposed to they've actually gained muscle tissue. So, yeah, I think one thing that might be useful to consider is perhaps if someone is very much so still kind of new to resistance training, yeah. the stimulus 
to their body might kind of provoke a bit of an inflated reaction compared to someone else. Um, but even so, it's not particularly possible, um, as Danny said, without performance enhancing drugs. Yeah. So it's just that illusion, isn't it? Of it's it is possible in some circumstances, like Millie said, if someone is new to resistance training or they've done a bit here and there but it's not really been in a structured way and then they get a coach, they have a structured resistance training program applying progressive overload every single week and they've entered a calorie deficit, then they're probably going to gain muscle tissue but someone who's more advanced and has already taken advantage of those newbie gains, they probably won't gain muscle tissue. Yeah, unfortunately my newbie gains are well and truly gone <laughs> so am I. <laughs> Millie, someone asked, do you girls talk outside of check-ins about life stuff? Haha. <laughs> um, so in terms of, I think there's certain elements where I might mention to Danny like, oh, I don't know, I was out on the weekend, so I'm not feeling my best today, which has not been the case for a really long time because of <laughs> coronavirus and prep. But things like that, like circumstances which I might be going through, maybe if I've started a new work placement or things like that, like we might talk about things that are going on in my life and kind of just general kind of chit chat off the back of that. But um, I think it's also important to consider that your coach is not your best friend. Like they're not there to pick up your messages all the time. They're not there just for a chin wag. Like your coach um, is there to, guide you with you know your nutrition your training your your whole coaching kind of aspect of your life but there's no need to kind of just talk about general stuff and like yes some people who um are friends can coach each other but i quite like the fact that there's a bit of a kind of formal coach client relationship because as a coach you have to command authority because if you don't it just means that your clients are going to try and push things and walk all over you a little bit, which is not how things should be done. You have to respect your coach because you have employed them for a service. Um, so even though that sounds a little bit formal, you've got to consider that, you know, you wouldn't have a close family member or, you, you know, your bestie, would you really trust them that much? Like in terms of what is truly, truly best for you from a, like an objective perspective, I think. Yeah, I completely agree. And think about like, I'm sure some of you guys watching this have tried to give friends and family advice before on like weight loss, nutrition, training. Do they ever listen to it? Mm. Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> so it's quite nice to have somewhat of an element of formality. I certainly would say that I get along with my clients really well, but there still has to be an element of like, okay, this is my business, it is my job, and I'm not just chatting with like 50 friends. Yeah. It is a coach-client relationship. I think that is important for clients to consider that you might just fancy messaging your coach to, you know, let them let them know how your day's gone, but you've got to think that they've got 50 other people, and if they're getting 50 other people just to say, hey, how are you doing today? Like, that's a yeah. lot of time and energy which they could be putting into bettering their knowledge, investing it into your business, unless it really does require a response or it's important. Do you need to send that message? Just a question. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's my kind of perspective. So there is a bit of an etiquette there to have in terms of um, just respecting people's time. Danny, do you have favourites as a coach? No, I don't have favourites. Damn it. Obviously, <laughs> obviously <laughs> it's really nice, like we said earlier, when a client respects your time and when someone is adherent and um, they respect what you do, they trust you, that's really nice. But I wouldn't say, oh, like, I know, I hate Millie, but like, Rosie's my favourite client, you know? <laughs> Damn it, Rosie's it's just, the favourite. I think it's a bit <laughs> unprofessional to say yeah. you have favourites. Um, but like I said, there's clients who, who are a little bit maybe easier to coach just because they do what they're told and they, they fulfil their side of the, the bargain, the commitment, and they do what they're supposed to do as a client but that's just pretty self-explanatory really. Yeah, no, agreed. It's exactly the same for me and my clients. Um, there are those who I know might require a little bit more of my time and attention, um, but it doesn't mean that you know I favorite them any more or any less. And that changes actually depending on what different clients are going through in their life. Yeah. So it's, it's, never, it's never stagnant, like it will always change. Um, and 
at the end of the day, we are all human. So as coaches, we understand that other people will have circumstances in their life that sometimes mean that they can't be on point 100% of the time and that is totally okay. Yeah. Like, it, it's, it's not a bad thing. And that's what we're here for. Like, one of my pet hates actually is when someone doesn't check in if they've had a bad week. Mm. That's when you need to check in because that's when I can help you the most. You're not checking in for me to be like, right, well done, carry on. Like, you're <laughs> checking in for me to be able to help you. So it's more important that you check in on the bad weeks than the good weeks. Yeah, I just echo that because I, I've had to say that a million and one times. So yeah, definitely agree with that. So Millie, is there anything you've never told me? <laughs> is there anything? Um, no, th there's actually not. There, as, as I was saying earlier, like you have to be completely honest and even if you are like ever embarrassed or not happy with something maybe that's happened or that you've done or things might not be working out great at the end of the day if you still lie about that your coach it, you're missing out on, a, on, on an opportunity to be helped if that makes sense so i would never not tell danny something because it could just shoot me in the foot further down the line like it could like say if i was doing something which i was hiding from you and over time that inconsistency had a massive impact like why would i want to do that <laughs> i don't understand so no i've genuinely hand on heart always told danny everything that goes on um danny have you ever lied to a coach no um no i've been very upfront with people and like an example of this one of my clients sent me a message this morning she's on prep at the moment and she said danny i'm really sorry like i thought i had a crumpet and some cream cheese left over yesterday so I ate it and I didn't and I was like it's okay don't worry just remove that from today like energy balance over the two days will still be the same so it's not the end of the world and your client is not gonna full-on have a go at you yes they might enforce a little bit of discipline but they're not gonna be like you know they're not gonna have a go at you <laughs> yeah like I, I've done that on prep I think there was one day I had an extra like five grams of peanut butter like whoa a whole 45 extra calories like yeah. yeah i just said to danny like whoops i thought it was in this meal but it wasn't and that was it like but at the end of the day that yeah nothing major has happened enough for me to be able to lie to be honest yeah <laughs> my life's not that excited at the moment <laughs> <laughs> mine wasn't on prep either <laughs> what are my best and worst traits as a client um best traits you're very consistent with checking in very adherent don't complain crack on <laughs> Millie is a very good client. <laughs> worst trait, I wouldn't say she has a worst trait. I'd say something she could maybe improve on is just, um, she's very busy, which is amazing. Her work ethic is incredible, but just winding down a little bit more and managing stress. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, I think um, it builds up quite quickly to the point where I'm always just like, oh shit, it's built up. <laughs> like, and then yeah. I'm like, sorry, Danny was a little bit stressed, didn't really sleep that much. But well, I can relate to that, like, I, I would say that I'm pro that's probably very similar for myself when I'm a client, so it's not something that I'm like, oh, she's shit and this is a shit trait. It's just something that she could potentially improve on a little bit. Yeah. Or so could I. So I try and spin a lot of plates at once, but obviously just due to the kind of transition that I will now be doing into only having to focus within the next few weeks on my own business, that's going to free up 40 hours a week, supposedly, from my full-time yeah. job. So. Um, it's going to help a lot. What is the best and worst thing about your coach? As I said earlier, I went to Danny for her experience and knowledge, but what I've found from working with Danny just like long term is how much she really, really cares. Like you really, really care to the kind of like what we were just saying then, like you overwork yourself almost because you care so much, but I know that she's just invested in my journey as she possibly can be, which is really important to me. Like you don't want, you don't ever want to feel like you're all, like checking responses are rushed from a coach or anything like that. I, I literally feel like Danny has all the time for me and I never ever hesitate to drop her a message or anything like that. The worst thing about having Danny as my coach is probably the fact that we live so far away from each other. Yeah. So I'd like to quite train with Danny a little bit more, maybe even like, I think even for me, something that would be quite useful maybe this is a little side project for danny's business in future is maybe even like a mentorship scheme or something like that because as we've said like i'm so excited and want to learn more that that could perhaps be a different aspect of coaching that we could have um, yeah. that i would quite enjoy so 
I think it's um, less of a bad thing and more of opportunities to explore. <laughs> yeah. Has my prep been much different to any of your other clients' preps? Oh God, yeah, everyone's completely different. Like some people will have to dig really fucking hard. Other people, oh, sorry if I can't swear. <laughs> <laughs> we can swear. <laughs> yeah, some people will just have to dig really hard to get stage lean. Other people will breeze through prep on high calories and not having too much cardio. And some of that is just down to how we're made and it just is what it is. There's not a lot we can do about it. We can obviously get calories as high as possible in the improvement season, train really hard, build muscle tissue. We can get expenditure down in the improvement season, set you up for the best prep possible, but some people just respond differently. And um, some people will experience the negative effects from a health perspective of prep a little bit more readily than others as well and to be honest like I'm one of those people I lose my cycle as soon as I start diet and it's like goodbye <laughs> um, but yeah everybody's different and it's just a case of when it comes to a prep when it comes to having an extreme goal you've just got to do what you've got to do unfortunately mm. and like I've said several times to Millie sorry not sorry it's just what we've got to do like it, it's unfortunate that we've got to dig Millie's protocols aren't horrendous but she is having to dig harder than some other clients and that is what it is. But one thing I've said to Millie is that she is a little bit more on the muscular side for bikini category. So having to dig, she's not looking super stringy and that's not a massive concern for me. Whereas someone who is a little bit less muscular, if they were having to run really flat for long periods of time and they were starting to look stringy that would be where the concern would be um but yeah it's not been so much of a problem for me yeah i think it's really important or at least i've thought this whole way it's important to stay in my own lane like yeah. i've seen other people who are prepping now they get like refeeds every four weeks or whatever and i haven't had one and you know we've just continuously digged deeper but at the end of the day why would I give a shit about what anyone else is doing when it's only what I've got to do to get me to that point? Like, there's no point at looking at other people's, like, business when you've got to do what you've got to do. Like, yeah. I just think being nosy and kind of, like, comparing yourself to others and their protocols is just not going to help you. And at the end of the day, I've said to Danny before, like, I don't care how hard we have to push. Like, I have a goal and I'll push to get to that goal. Um, and I think I've tried to manage things as well as possible. Um, also, like, I think it's it's important not to kind of look at what other people are doing and then kind of complain to your coach that you're not getting what they're getting or that kind of treatment or so-and-so only has to do, like, 20 minutes on the Stairmaster. Like, that's nice, but they're not you. Definitely. <laughs> so. And as well as each individual being different, every prep can be different. Some preps have felt like a breeze for me. Other preps have been horrendous and I've had to dig really hard and there's so many things which can influence that. Things like life stresses can make prep so much more difficult. Um, and yeah, there's so many different things which can influence like your response. So be open to just doing what you have to do, ultimately. Yeah. Top three pieces out of advice for someone's first prep. I think you need to make sure that you're with your coach from your improvement season going into your prep. So that firstly they, they can prime you to have the best prep possible um, and so that they get to know you. Don't just try and jump into a prep with a coach that you've never worked with before because they don't know you, they don't know your body. Like that's the worst thing you could possibly do. And you want to build up that good relationship. Like by the time that it came around to prep, I knew Danny like very well and we were just like, okay, ready to go. And I felt comfortable with the whole process and what we'd planned out. Yeah, just recapping on what we said, staying in, in your own lane, doing what you have to do. Number three, probably stop complaining like <laughs> prep is hard like it is hard but you've chosen to do this pressure is a privilege like no one's forcing you to do this i think i've seen a, a huge amount of this is people constantly almost like almost like like how you say danny quite often like it's a self-fulfilling prophecy if you constantly tell yourself that you're hungry and you're exhausted you're going to just feel even worse like yeah. and, and there's just no point in doing that whereas if you just take each day by day, each step by step, then that's really, really important as well. The main kind of important one that I would say is your relationship with food before going into a prep. Like before I went into prep, I like, 
I was at that point where I was kind of like not really having much of an appetite anymore. I was kind of feeling a little bit ready to diet. I was having my untracked days and eating um, a bit more like in tune with just, you know, intuitively eating um, to have a bit more flexibility and freedom. And I didn't have any kind of bad relationship with food. And this is coming from me in the past who has suffered with binge eating and I sought help for that previously. But we went into this prep with like the best place for me in terms of food and here we are like under three weeks out and i'm still even though we're digging i'm still not struggling i'm still not food focused i'll eat my meals i'll carry on with the rest of my day like i don't think and obsess over food i just get on with what needs to be done yeah those are my tips um that was four you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the extra <laughs> What would you say, Danny, in terms of anything else from there? Yeah, I would say the same, really. Make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons as well. Mm. A massive red flag for me is if you want to get stage lean and you're not willing to put body fat back on afterwards, and if you want to lose fat and keep it off, then your goal should not be to step on stage because you will have to reverse the process of prep afterwards. You'll have to regain body fat for health to be able to perform and function like a human being. So and be warm, you can get to be warm. Yeah, when you get to be warm, <laughs> you get to have energy, like you have your sex drive come back. There's so many benefits to regaining the necessary body fat for health. And if you are getting into competing, you have to be accepting of that and, and doing it for not just the prep itself, but the whole entire process of the improvement season. Um, it's a good sign usually if you're interested in bodybuilding as a whole, like you enjoy watching the other categories as well as just your own. Because if you're the type of person who's like, oh, I like bikini, but I don't really like bodybuilding and I don't like going to watch shows and the other categories don't interest me, then maybe just like, do a photo shoot and get yourself in good condition and then you'll be able to maintain a little bit closer to that and not have the the negatives that come along with a prep such as the detriments to your body image your potential detriments to your relationship with food um the the risk of losing your menstrual cycle things like that it's not necessary to push yourself there unless you are bodybuilding for the right reasons and you love the sport as a whole and you really really want to pursue that goal and enjoy both phases um so yeah just question like should i step on stage or should i just do a, a more sustainable fat loss phase am i doing it for the right reasons like millie said make sure your body image or relationship with food is in a really good place beforehand work with a coach don't just try and do it on your own um, and make sure before you enter a prep you've spent a significant amount of time out of a deficit don't start a prep if you've already been dieting like six months because it's just not going to go well no it takes you like three four months to recover just to get back to a like healthy enough state anyway if not even longer so if you think that you go and do another like six month improvement season then you prep again like <laughs> I want to enjoy food for a bit longer than that. I'm just saying that yeah. now. Um, just make sure you know what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. Like, it's an extreme sport. It's not just like, oh, I've started making some progress in the gym, so now I'm going to compete. It takes a lot of forward planning, and you just have to know what you're getting yourself into because sometimes it's the glamorous side that's shown on social media and things like that, and you don't really quite get a grasp of what you're putting yourself through. Yeah, and uh, just off the back of that, save up loads of money yeah a lot of money <laughs> i probably spent a good house deposit on competing maybe more honestly yeah rent renting for a while that's all i'm gonna say okay i think this is the final one which is a nice one to kind of end it on so danny what is my potential for my bodybuilding career or what do you think the future might hold so i think millie has loads of potential and a large reason for that is just her ability to adhere and crack on with everything like it's a good sign that she's doing it for the right reason. She's handled this prep so well and she just gets on with it. She's willing to do what's necessary to get to, to the end goal. And I can tell that she loves bodybuilding. Um, so I know she's doing it for the right reasons and that will take someone a lot further than genetics ever, ever will. That being said, Millie's got decent genetics alongside that. Like, I think she, she, like I said earlier, she's one of the slightly more muscular bikini girls. So I think if Millie wanted to go up a category, she certainly could. She would obviously have to spend a long time in an improvement season gaining muscle tissue. 
but I see no reason why you couldn't step up a class if you wanted to. Um, and I know that's something you might be interested in seeing as though there's a few figure poses thrown in there every all now and again. <laughs> all I'm going to say is um, after my shows, I'm just going to be eating big to get big and we'll see what happens. Yeah. I can't tell. I actually don't really know what the future holds and I haven't thought that far ahead. I've said this previously because I'm just focused on what I've got to do now. And the thing is as well, like you never know where life's going to take you. Yeah. And you can't really predict the future you know Millie might get to a point in her life where she has a massive work related goal and she just can't commit that year to stepping on stage mm, yeah. that's absolutely okay and like my my values have changed I no, no longer step on stage myself and it doesn't make you any more or less of a person if Millie wants to she has huge potential in the sport but that decision has to come from her not from anybody else um, so yeah, she has loads of potential, but it's it's up to the client what they do with that potential, really. Yeah. We'll see, we'll see what happens, but for now, we're gonna go and train. <laughs> I yeah. think that's it, we're done and dusted. <laughs>